Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Faith Bridge. So glad you've chosen to worship with us today. As Pastor Ken said, we're going to be in the book of Philippians chapter 2. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles, turn there, put your finger there as a placeholder. We'll get to the passage shortly. If you don't have a Bible, please raise your hands. The ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. Please accept that Bible as a gift from us if you do not currently own one. Philippians chapter 2. Before we uh, jump into the Word, let's take a moment and pray together. Father, thank you for a new day and the opportunity that we have to gather in your house to lift up the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray now, Lord, as we turn our attention to your Word, that your Holy Spirit would come and be our teacher just as you promised and guide us into all truth. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Moving through life as a pastor is an unusual lifestyle. There are aspects to it that are different from what many people are accustomed to. Not necessarily better or worse, they're just different. And there are various experiences that pastors and their families move through that are unique to the pastoral family. One of those that I have observed over the years is uh, the uh, assumptions that some people make about what it must be like to live in a pastor's home. And uh, I've really been amazed at some of the things uh, that I've heard um, Some people assume that we wake up in the morning singing hymns to one another, (laughs) that we move throughout the day quoting scripture, that we meet each and every challenge in our lives in a spirit of prayer, and that peace reigns, peace abides in our home. Well, if you happen to be one of those persons who's carried that assumption, I hate to burst your bubble, but take it from me, it ain't that way. No, we have stress and anxiety and conflict and difficulties and pain and sorrow and just like everybody else. I mean, this sermon series, Calm the Home Down, is every bit as relevant to me and to my family as it may be to you and your family. We have anxiety, we have stressors just like everyone else. A prime example is the Christmas season. The holidays are always stressful for everyone. It's a busy time. Things are uh, different than they typically are. And there's so much to do. The pressure is there. And no different in our household for a lot of different reasons. It is a high-stress time. If you've ever been in our home during the holidays, you know that um, Christmas decorations are very important to my wife, Becky. Uh, They are a high-priority item for her. Um, she does a marvelous job. We, we don't go over the top. We're not a Griswold family Christmas kind of thing. But we do have a, a good bit of stuff. Uh, she really loves the trees and the garlands and the wreaths and the stockings and nativities. And, now, all, all of that is, is very, very important to her in order to celebrate Christmas. Uh, for me, they don't rate quite so high on the priority list. Now, I'm no Scrooge. I I like them. I'm certainly not opposed to them. And when Becky has finished her decorating magic, I enjoy the ambiance and the feeling as much as anybody. It's wonderful. I think the thing that keeps it kind of low on the priority list for me is all of the time and the work that is involved in decorating and then undecorating. A few weeks ago, of course, as the holidays are drawing to a close, it was time to undecorate. Uh, I was seated in our living room. It was uh, sort of a chilly day in Houston that day, and I was seated in front of the fireplace uh, enjoying my favorite pastime, reading a book. And I looked over at the top of my book, and there 
stood my lovely bride, and she was inquiring as to whether or not I would please help with taking the decorations down. And my response could best be characterized as the dangerous pause. It wasn't a no, but it wasn't a real resounding yes either. It was just kind of a... I've noticed in in the marital counseling sessions that I do that uh, husbands tend to exhibit this behavior more than their wives do, and uh, it never contributes to marital harmony. Not a good thing, not anything that I would recommend. And uh, so here I found myself participating in the dangerous pause, and things just went downhill from there. Not good. Arguing and conflict and recriminations back and forth, you know, and... Conflict and anxiety, stress was in our home. Well, I was full of self-justification for my position. Uh, I didn't necessarily verbalize this self-justification out loud, but in my mind, I was rehearsing why I was right. Saying to myself, well, you know, the problem is the decorations. If we didn't have the decorations, there wouldn't be any conflict. Just need to get rid of those silly decorations. And I was completely satisfied with that self-justification until I began to study for today's sermon and discovered that God had some distinctly different thoughts on the matter than I did. So, let me read for you, beginning in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one Spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." Through this passage, the Spirit was making quite clear to me that the decorations were definitely not the problem. The decorations were not the source of the conflict and the anxiety and the stress in our home. I was the source of all of that. My selfishness, my unwillingness to serve my wife in something that was important to her was the immediate and undeniable cause of the conflict in our house. I began to look at this passage in a completely different way. I I have read this passage of Scripture literally hundreds of times, but in this particular reading, this study, God began to open my eyes to new truths that I had not seen before. And so in the time that we have, I want to walk you through this passage because... In these words, Paul helps us understand how putting into practice God's Word really can calm the home down, really can bring the peace, the love, the joy, all of those things that we desire. Now, in verses 1 and 2, you will notice that Paul gives a very apt description as to how Christians should behave, what it should be like in a Christian's home. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, speaking to Christians, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, 
If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Friends, that is a perfect description of a home that is calmed down. There's no anxiety there. There's no conflict. There's no stress. He's describing a home of peace where people are of one mind, where there is love. They are one in spirit. That sounds like the kind of place any of us would want to live. That sounds like the kind of place any of us would want to work or be in community or wherever we might find ourselves. This is a stress-free environment that Paul is describing. The problem is most of us don't enjoy this kind of living most of the time. Our lives are hit or miss. We have seasons where it may be calm and peaceful, but by and large, from where I sit as a pastor, I see stress and I see anxiety and I see people having a difficult time moving through life with a calm home. So what are we to do about it? What is the key to having this kind of home? Well, Paul continues in verses 3 and 4. Do nothing, he says, out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Not valuing yourself, but looking to the needs, the wants, the desires, the priorities of others. You can write it down, friends. I hope you will. Servanthood is the pathway to peace. Servanthood is the pathway to peace. If you want peace in your home, the first step, the most important step, is a willingness to serve one another, to prioritize one another over ourselves. In a little bit extra study, I came across James 3.16. Jesus' brother, James, wrote that book. And in that particular verse, he simply reiterates what Paul is saying here. He says, listen, wherever there is uh, selfish ambition, wherever there is envy, that kind of thing, there will be disorder. Disorder follows selfishness every time. So as I'm sitting there in my study, soaking in these words, I begin to do a, an inventory. And I begin to sort of tally up how many times in our home have I been the source of conflict and stress simply because I was selfish. It was not a fun exercise. And the inventory went way, way too high. And I dare say many of us could probably engage in a similar inventory and come to a similar conclusion that far too often the stress and anxiety in our home is there because we're selfish, because we want our way. Now, sure, there are plenty of things that happen to us along the way that create stress that we can do nothing about. Things over which we have no power. But there is at least one thing that I am convinced is a primary cause of stress that we absolutely can do something about, and that is our own selfishness. Now, I don't think anybody, at least I hope no one, wakes up in the morning thinking immediately about how selfish they can be. Can't imagine someone rolling out of the bed and just pondering, hmm... How can I make sure I get my way all day today? And if we're a Christ follower, more often than not, we're probably praying and hoping that we won't be that way. At least that's the direction that our heart desires to go in. And yet somehow, some way, as the day unfolds, it's as if selfishness just sort of creeps up behind us. And before we know it, we're kidnapped And we're being that selfish person that we don't want to be. We didn't intend it. We didn't desire it. 
but there it is. It's frustrating, it is painful, and when we stop to consider that it impacts not only the condition of our own heart, but it condi- uh, impacts the overall condition of our home, it's even more painful. So what on earth are we to do about it? How can we have the sort of home that Paul is describing? How can we be the sort of person who prioritizes other people over ourselves? Well, one of the many things that I love about the Bible, it, it is not merely diagnostic. The Bible doesn't exist just to tell us our problems. No, it tells us our problems and then it tells us what to do about them, what God can do about them. So let's read on. Beginning in verse 5. In your relationships with one another. Powerful start. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Friends, verse 7. Highlight it, underline it, memorize it. It is one of the most powerful meaningful verses in all of the scriptures. He made himself nothing. We're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. God come in the flesh, made himself nothing. In other words, he got himself out of the way. He got himself out of the way so that he could humble himself and come and serve us in the way that we most desperately needed to be served. We needed someone to come and rescue us from our sins. We needed someone to come and live a life we could not live. We needed someone to come and die in our place. And Jesus just put his own needs and his own wants, he put himself off to the side, made himself nothing for our sake. You see, our biggest challenge when it comes to battling this thing called selfishness is not the situation. It's not the circumstances. It's not the type of home that we're in. It's not the sort of thing that we're being asked to do. That's not the primary problem. And it's never the other individual. No matter who they are, no matter how they're behaving, That's not the big issue. The biggest obstacle we face when it comes to selfishness is us. We are our own worst enemy. We are masters at putting ourselves first because we think that's the way. We think that is what is going to bring us what we want. But in fact, it never does. No, Jesus shows us that the way to life is through death. The way to becoming something is by becoming nothing. Servanthood is the pathway to peace. Now, even as I say that, I know that in some of our minds, a thought is beginning to percolate to the top, and it goes something like this. Wait a minute, Pastor Dan. Are you asking me to be a doormat? Is this what we're talking about here? That I'm to have no say in my home or my place of work or my community? Are you just asking me to lay down and let people walk all over me? Is that what this is, doormat theology? No, not at all. Not at all. All, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, it is as we become nothing that we become something. Read on, beginning in verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
the fundamental truth of the Christian life is that we live as we die. We put other people before ourselves. We take a step of faith. And we trust that even though this doesn't feel right, even though the world doesn't say it's right, God said that if I put other people first, I'm going to have life. And I'm going to experience life as Jesus intended me to experience it. I want you to notice something about how Jesus made himself nothing. He didn't do it under coercion. He didn't do it because he had to. No, he did it because we desperately needed him to. He did it because he loved us, because he had mercy on us, because his heart was filled with compassion. He owed us nothing. And if we are going to follow Jesus faithfully, we too must make a decision to serve others by an act of our will. It is an act of obedience to Christ. That's not a popular word in our culture these days. But people who follow Jesus are obedient. We have to decide in our will, I am going to do this. Though everything in me says don't, no, I'm going to choose to do it. We can't do it because somebody makes us do it. We shouldn't do it because the preacher said to do it. Because if we serve other people because we have to, our hearts are going to be filled with resentment. And we dare not try to think our way into it. Reason won't work. Because if we try to think about how we must serve other people, every excuse, every rationalization known to man will rise to our defense and convince us why we should not serve. No, it is simply a matter of faith, putting our trust in the Word of God, putting our trust in the person of Jesus Christ, that if He can go the way of servanthood, I can go the way of servanthood. It is a paradox of the Christian life. That which we think will bring us the greatest joy, namely getting our own way, only leads to pain. When we're selfish, there's conflict and there's pain and there's stress and there's anxiety. On the other hand, the way that we think will only lead to pain that is becoming a servant, leads to joy, leads to peace, leads to life. As we die, we live. I saw this illustrated in Living Color about three years ago. I had the privilege of traveling to the town of Shimla, located in the northernmost reaches of India. It sits right at the foothills of the Himalayas. You can step outside and see the beautiful mountains there in the distance. My host for that week was a man by the name of Amar Bhatia. By almost any measure, I'm, I'm going to say by almost any American measure anyway, Amar really had no reason to be happy. He lived in a little shack, really, clinging to the side of a steep mountain. He made no money. He was a pastor, and his flock wasn't that big. And even if they had been big, there wasn't a whole lot of money to be given. And day after day after day, Amar gets up, and he gets on his motorcycle, and he drives through the town of Shimla, and he discovers how he can serve his little flock, and how he can serve other people. He knows who the people are that don't have anything to eat. He knows who the people are who don't have anything to wear. He knows who the people are that are suffering with illness and personal problems and conflict resolution problems. And he makes it his priority day after day after day to go and serve these people. He believes himself to be God's emissary to that town, to demonstrate what it means to live as Jesus lived. And yet, 
with none of the things that we take for granted here that we think will bring joy and happiness. I can tell you that hands down, Amar is the happiest man I have ever met in my life. Bar none. I mean, that, that smile right there is on his face constantly. And from the moment I got to Shimla, when I stepped off the train and found myself in his embrace, welcoming, welcoming me, he was so enthusiastic about how we could move out into the community together and begin to serve Jesus. And I was happy to go with him. And I kept waiting to see the facade fall and see the cynicism finally rise or to see the complaining finally come to the top, but I never saw it. I remember walking down the street in Shimla, lots of shops around us, and out of the blue, Amar bursts into song, praising God. I was jumping off of... He just couldn't contain himself. He loved giving himself away because he had discovered that as he gave himself away, he found himself and he found life. Next summer, I get to go back and see him again. And I'm looking forward to sitting at his feet and learning from a man who knows what it means to love and serve as Jesus loved and served. One of the things that I appreciate about Faith Bridge is that we have always had a strong serving culture here. From the very beginning, Pastor Ken made sure that that value, that priority was a part of our DNA. How many times have I heard Pastor Ken say, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. It's simply a part of being a faith bridger to serve and to cultivate that perspective and that attitude, the same perspective and attitude that Jesus had. We talk about it, we preach about it, and we do so for a number of reasons. First of all, because that's what it means to be a disciple. If you're going to be a disciple, you're going to be like Jesus. And if you're going to be like Jesus, you're going to be a servant. A second reason we talk about serving a lot is because the needs are tremendous. Both outside the walls of this church and inside, there are countless things that need to be done in order to facilitate the ministry of this church to meet the needs that people have in their lives. It is important that we have someone with a smile standing there at the door, shaking hands, greeting people. You may not be aware of this. Maybe you are. Maybe you're one of these people. But I am always astounded when someone tells me about how the first time they came to Faith Bridge, they sat in their car for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, just trying to work up the nerve to come in because they didn't know what it was going to be like. They'd never been to church before. They didn't know if they were dressed right. They didn't know how we would act. How vital is it then that we have someone at the door who welcomes them with arms wide open with love? It's incredibly vital that we have a ministry called The Road where individuals go out into all places all over the earth sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, building homes, providing clothing, making sure people have something to eat, doing the sorts of things that Jesus has called us to do. The needs are tremendous. But there's a third reason we serve, and uh, perhaps we're guilty as preachers of not talking about this reason enough. We talk about serving because of the joy that it brings, like nothing else. I mean, unless you are just an absolute jerk who's been selfish your whole life, you, you know what I'm talking about. How many times have I concluded a mission trip only to have one of those individuals approach me and say something like, Pastor Dan, I really thought I was going to be the one who would go and be a blessing, but I'm the one who got blessed. I thought I was going to go and be the servant, but they wound up serving me. There is a joy that comes with serving that can't be found anywhere else. And yet far too many of us don't know what that's like. Now, many of us do. 
Many of us here at Faith Bridge have heard the challenge and we have risen to meet the challenge and we're serving and that's why so many awesome things happen at this church and because of this church. But you know, there are people here listening to my voice right now. You're selfish. I don't know any other way to put it. Now, maybe no one's ever challenged you. Maybe someone has and you just chose to pretend like you didn't hear it. But you come here Sunday after Sunday and you see the awesome things that are happening and your way of thinking, whether you're aware of it or not, is, hey, this is pretty cool. I think I'll just come and enjoy what all these other people are doing. That's called being a taker and not a giver. That's not how we do things here because that's not how joy is found. Not in taking, but in serving and in giving ourselves away. And so this morning, I want to issue the challenge again. And I want to challenge you in two ways. First, I want to challenge you on the home front. And you know, anytime I stand before you and preach about the home, I'm, I'm challenging myself too. I think I made clear at the beginning of the message, my family's not exempt but I want to challenge you to gauge your servanthood at home. And he, here's the way you do that. Ask. Sit down with your family or your roommates or whoever you live with and ask them, am I a servant? Am, am I modeling servanthood for you? Are you learning how to be a servant because you watch me? And I bet they'll tell you. And then follow up with the question, how can I serve you? What do you need me to do? Who do you need me to be? Secondly, I want to challenge you to consider serving here at Faith Bridge. Because as I said, the needs are tremendous. In your bulletin, you should have this bookmarker with a list. I'm going to ask if we can bring the lights up. Um, and if everybody would, please pull this out. Here is, honestly, a rather short listing of the serve opportunities we have at Faith Bridge, both here on campus and outside the walls. For the next few moments, in a spirit of prayer, I, I want you to look this over and begin to ask God, Lord, where would you have me serve? What, what is it that you would have me do so that I can continue to become the man or woman that you're calling me to be. You'll notice that the very first one at the top of the list is usher team. I happen to know that that is a vital need. Same folks far too often are serving over and over and over. We need more ushers. We need more hospitality folks to help people get seated. Consider that. Consider giving your time to children or to students. Consider going on a mission trip. We've got more mission trips available this year than in any time in our history. For individuals, for couples, for families. It's going to be a great mission season. There are mission opportunities right here too. There are orphans that need a place to live. There are families that don't have enough to eat not five miles away from this church. Don't walk out of here today missing out. That's my hope for you, is that you're going to miss out on something that can only be found one way. Making ourselves nothing and giving ourselves away for the glory of God and for the good of others. We're going to pray, and um, you take a moment, check one or two of these off. You're not committing yourself, by the way. This is simply expressing interest. And then as we dismiss in just a few moments, you can drop these in a basket as you go out. Even better, when you leave today, make your way to the East Atrium, where there are tables... For each and every one of these ministries.
and you can get all of your questions answered, time commitment, what's involved, skills, tasks, that sort of thing. Stop by and let some folks tell you about what they're doing, about the good things that are happening in the life of our church. Will you pray with me, please? Father, it never ceases to amaze us that you would humble yourself to die for us. Forgive us for not understanding that, for not acknowledging that. And forgive us for our selfishness. It rises to the top far too often and it creates far too much conflict in our homes. Help us, O oh God, to live as servants so that we might be a source of peace in our home and to live as servants so that needs can be met and hearts can be changed and the name of Jesus can be lifted up. And we offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. Thanks for joining us. My name is Justin Teague, and I am the Worship and Communications Pastor at FaithBridge. And I'm here with Dan Slagle, our Care and Bridging Pastor, who just finished part three of our sermon series, Calm the Home Down, called Value Others Above Yourself. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Great Good to message. be here. Thanks. Uh, we had two questions come okay. in. Uh, the first one is about uh, parenting. Uh, she says, Pastor Dan, I have a question about how much we as parents should serve our children. I have found that conflict and anxiety can arise when my spouse and I have different expectations as to how we should serve our children. Take for instance, when we ask them to clean their rooms, we have different expectations as to what level they should be able to meet at their age. That in turn creates anxiety and stress all around as we discuss how much we should help them slash serve them versus letting them grow, stretch themselves. Can you speak to serving in the home, serving our children, growing in differing expectation levels? Yes, I can. Uh, I don't know of any home that is immune to this sort of thing. Uh, differing expectations can arise over any number of issues, but... Uh, I think the issue that is causing the anxiety here is uh, n not so much uh, serving your children, but you and your husband getting on the same page. Mm. Um, I would take whatever time was necessary to resolve that issue first, because if you don't figure that one out, it, anxiety is gonna be there for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And if you need someone to referee, you know, we have lots of resources here. Sometimes couples just can't get things figured out. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you can't, it's always good to ask someone for help. So um, I would say getting on the same page, having similar expectations will go a long way toward diminishing the anxiety. What would be a good first step for someone who's not sure how to ask for help uh, from FaithBridge? Call and ask for Beth Ellis here at the church office, and she will be glad to uh, either provide service herself or point you in the right direction for someone. Great. Second question. Uh -huh. uh, what happens when serving feels more like a job? How do we get back to feeling a joy and an eagerness to serve? That's a great question. Um, you know, any task can become that eventually. Even, even things that we really like to do can go south for us. So I, I think you need to ask yourself several questions. Uh, first of all, uh, is there anything going on inside of me completely apart from this job that is impacting my attitude, my perspective? Um, is there something that has changed about the task? Uh, maybe it's the same general type of work, but maybe there are aspects of it that you're not feeling so great about. Um, 
maybe it is time to move on to something else. Perhaps it's time though just to simply say, you know what, every job gets this way once in a while, I just gotta tough it out and mm -hmm. see, fake it till you make it. <laughs> um, but I would certainly go through that checklist first of asking, okay, so what's going on here? Is it, is it the job or is it me? Or is it circumstances surrounding sure. the job? You know, a follow-up question to this, I think a lot of times, uh, especially in serving the Lord or serving in the church, um, I might say, you know, I felt called to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens if I don't feel this joy anymore? Does that mean the calling is gone? Or does that mean, how do I, is a calling last forever? Right, not necessarily. Uh, a, a call, it, can be a call to a specific task, or it can be a call to a vocation, mm. which would be a little longer la lasting, hopefully, than a task. But yeah, I don't, I don't think that God tells us, okay, you've gotta be an usher for the rest of your life, or <laughs> you know, something of, of that nature. He understands that we move through different seasons, uh, different things happening at home that will uh, impact how we're feeling about a given job, so there's nothing wrong with stepping back and evaluating. Great. Dan, thank you so much for being here you today. Bet. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next week with Pastor Ken and the conclusion of our series, Calm the Home Down. Have a great week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.